What's going on you guys? Hope everyone's having a great Thanksgiving today. Hope you're enjoying time with your families, eating some good food, and don't forget to get some good Black Friday deals for the remainder of the week while you still can. Because let's be honest, any buck that we can save nowadays, we really need it. So if you guys have missed the past couple of videos, here we have Josh's car. that actually came in, at, just wasn't running right overall, and we ended up tearing it down, and we discovered it had a hole in the piston from a drop valve here caused by cheap fuel injectors. And well, the thing was just full of oil and it turned the whole motor into an oil pump rather than an operating engine. So the past couple of videos, we've got a new engine resealed. We got it put back in and we got it fired up for the first time, last video. I was super happy with the way that the engine ran those couple seconds, nice, smooth, and even between all six cylinders. So we went ahead and we've hooked everything else up we started to top up and fill up fluids, and now we've got our timing light hooked up for our first cylinder to time the engine once we get it up to operating temperature. So not only are we doing that, we're doing a couple other things like tuning sensors, TPS, checking the idle air control, and bleeding some fluids and trying to, you know, idle this thing out and get it road worthy. So if any of those things are something that you guys are interested in and know how to do, stay tuned and we'll show you guys how. This is pretty much a little checkup that you do anytime you go put your motor back in the car once you've done work and you've taken everything off. Especially for a timing kit because you take off the crank seal over here, so you have to remove the crank angle sensor. When you do that, essentially you're throwing it out of time, and when you do a new timing belt, you need to retime it anyways. You can't always just mark it and put it in the same spot. Enough of the talk, let's get started. First, let's go ahead and grab our coolant funnel over here, so we can at least throw this on and start burping out some coolant while we wait. Put a little 50-50 in there. And I actually went ahead and put on the exhaust, hooked it all up yesterday. I did kind of record a video and stuff, but I didn't like how I did the intro, so we redid it today. And well, we did a little bit of RTV on the exhaust gasket to get it sealed up, kind of how it was put on, since I don't have correct size exhaust gaskets. But the exhaust is fully on now. So that technically means we can drop this thing back onto the ground. We can wheel it back to where we can open up the garage a little bit since it's raining and we can fire this thing up. And since we had all of that oil in the exhaust, I cleaned most of it out. Now there is gonna be residual and that means it's gonna burn off and it's gonna smoke. We're hopefully gonna point all the smoke outside. And at the same time, we'll bleed our coolant, lift the nose in, do power steering and get this car situated. Before we fire it up, we're actually going to tighten our crank bolt down to 159 to 175 foot-pounds of torque. I do about 165, 170. It's best to do this while in fifth gear with your wheels chalked. If your car's automatic, I honestly do not know what to tell you. It's not something I'm experienced with. So while we got the front wheels chalked and the back wheels chalked in fifth gear with the parking brake on, Crank the sucker down. Now before we go firing this up, I'm gonna show you guys kind of how we hooked up this timing light. So pretty much your timing light, this is one from Harbor Freight. You'll have this advanced setting and you always want that to stay on zero. So you read your actual timing. So if you advance at 10 degrees and you're looking for zero, zero will show up as 10 because it's advanced 10. So just to give you a little more understanding of how that setting works. So you've got cables that hook up to your positive and negative terminal of your battery. Well, also an inductive pickup right here that indicates the flow of the current. So you see the arrow? We want to see the current going down into the spark plug. What we used here is we just used a straight spark plug wire. It's much better if you actually have a straight one. This was actually a 90 degree that I cut all the rubber off and put it straight in and then we connect it straight to the spark plug. Pull the coil pack and just put it in line. You get a better reading testing from a bigger wire like this instead of the PTU loop that's over here, which is pretty much just a black wire like this coming off of your PTU or cylinder one. Something Nissan did to make it a little bit easier on you, but you get a way better reading doing this. So what we're gonna do after the car's warmed up, basically we wanna wait to the engine to get up to operating temperature because when it's cold, it advances timing to help it warm up. So it's not gonna read the same as it would once it's up to operating temperature. So pretty much if you have an issue hot starting your car, if it starts up good, cold every time, but when it's hot, it struggles to start, usually that is because your coolant temp sensor is going out 
and telling your car to shoot more fuel and timing when it's already warm because it thinks it's cold. Or when it's cold, it doesn't shoot enough fuel or timing because it thinks it's hot and it won't start. So hopefully that helps you guys a little bit. Coolant temp sensors cause a lot of weird funky issues. Always go for the OEM blue plastic connector. If it's red, it's original, throw it out. Back to the timing light. Basically, you have marks down here on your lower crank pulley or timing cover, I meant to say, but you do have a mark on your crank pulley. So pretty much you want to mark that with a white paint pen so you can help read it better. And we're going for right here in between 10 and 20, which is 15 degrees before top dead center. All turbo models are 15 degrees before top dead center. NA models are 15 degrees before top dead center, unless it's a 1996. 1996 has no VTC, so it's actually only 10 degrees before top dead center. I had my daily set wrong for quite a while, wondered why I acted so funny, and that was why. No one said anything about that. I just had to figure that out randomly one day, so the more you know. Now, it's time to fire this thing up. Let's get everything all prepared. Let's, uh, looks like we need a little bit more coolant. Hopefully it don't get too smoky. Let's raise this up. Now let's not gas ourselves out. Just a little bit. It's close. I don't like that weird whining noise. So let's kill it and let's actually pull that fan off and see if we take it off if the sound changes. So we pulled both the fan and the water pump pulley and belt and yet the sound is still there. So it's looking like some unfortunate news here. Something is either rubbing inside that I'm gonna have to open up and check or timing belt's too tight somehow. But either way, it's got to open back up because it's just making a sound that's just not right. I'll do it one more time for you guys, just in case you didn't notice. Where you could hear. Not a fan of that. Yeah, you can see it's getting a little smoky in here. Well, now to determine if we want to do it today or if we want to wait till after Thanksgiving. Pretty bummed this was supposed to come out for Thanksgiving, but it's the way she goes sometimes. It's kind of a shame I didn't notice that when it was really loud when I was doing open headers to be able to know and just be good, but I, <laughs> here we are. We'll probably just tear all this down. We'll get to where we figure out what it is. That's not what this video is about. So we're just, we'll be back when we figure out kind of a, maybe something. It's now the next morning. By the way, happy actual Thanksgiving. And well, I think we actually just figured out the issue. So we've got the coolant temp sensor all hooked up over here. So everything's still hooked up how it should be. We're just completely exposed. And well, let's just say, I know you guys remember that loud squeal because there's no way you could have missed it. Now, once I took those timing covers off, which we got all the parts over down there, after we figured out it wasn't the belts, listen to it when we start it now. temperature and get it all really bled out yet no sound so what i'm thinking is going on here is these timing covers are actually not centered because of these dress up bolts so if you look at these look how skinny that is of a bolt and how much room it has to play back and forth now the factory bolts are actually shouldered so basically there's another spot other than the threaded portion that is actually larger and this is the shoulder. So this centers the timing cover, puts it in the centered correct position away from the belt. Now, even though I looked in these covers and I see zero signs of any rub marks or anything, I still think this is it. There's not a single OEM style shouldered bolt on any of this. And I think that's what's kind of throwing it out of alignment and causing it to rub. We're just gonna put a couple OEM bolts here and there so we can kind of center this thing up and make sure that it's not rubbing and put it all back together. Big bummer, because now we officially cannot get this video out today for Thanksgiving because we have to let the RTV cure overnight. I know, bummer. But I'm super happy that we figured it out and we didn't actually have to take all the timing components apart and off is that was gonna be a real backbreaker 
and Nightmare. We'll take them dubs where we can get them. I guess we're gonna put it back on, do a little bit of testing, so we'll be back then. Now we're back and we've got a little update. So we actually just pulled all the timing components off, pulled all the timing covers off, crank pulley. What we ended up finding out is there was kind of accumulation of issues here. So the tensioner is staying too tight. I had to swap it to a new belt because for some reason the old belt is literally too tight. There's virtually no way I could reach that four millimeter gap. Swap the belt to a good new Gates one. Tensioner sorted out, that's done. Now, the reason why I took all that off is I discovered here on this timing cover, it's actually bent. Yeah, not supposed to be like that. That's actually supposed to overlap another part. It looks like it was bent to go behind. Now this is where the exhaust cam gear is. And you can see it's actually rubbing the rear cover right there. After playing musical parts for probably four hours now on my Thanksgiving. We have officially figured out it was the timing covers and it's a combination of the covers. And with the combination of this new backing plate, we could kind of tweak it where it stays away from rubbing right here, which is where it was rubbing the worst and away from this cam gear as it did wear a little indent in the cover itself. Learn from my mistakes or whatever the heck happened here. This is totally new to me. So stuff happens. You don't always get it at your first shot and let this be a testament to that. Now we're going to put the thing the rest of the way back together. Actually, let's just fire it up. No noises, whines, ticks, nothing. Just smooth as butter. Let's just get back to the fun stuff. We got it all back together, literally everything. We started getting it kind of topped up with fluid. And we started it up, made sure there's no squeaking, no issues. We got a power steering belt on it now, and we now have our alternator and stuff tensioned and all squared away. Pretty much now we're ready to go. The only kind of bummer, I think Gabby has my multimeter. I do already have a video on this, however, on my Z32 diagnostic video, but I do already have this set. I know it's set. I've done it on Brian's car. I've tested it twice. And well, we're gonna at least be able to do everything else. Honestly, we just, okay. We need to hook up our timing light stuff because that is pretty much our first priority. We wanna get it up to temp and then time it immediately. So I don't know if you guys can really tell, but we actually just added a new light in here. We grabbed another one from Harbor Freight because they had a sale going on. I figured we may as well just scoop a couple things like that. We did get another one. I'm just still trying to figure out where to put it. I grabbed an extension cord because I have two outlets <laughs> other than some in this room. We at least got one more drawstring light like we had at the old shop. And we do still have Chris's other one back there like that one that he hooked us up with. But since there's no outlets, we got to figure out how to wire it all in. I hope you guys are going to be able to see a little bit better now. I know that was a really bad issue in the first or last shop, so I'm trying to solve some of that, especially get a just generally more light in here. <sighs> see your breath out here today. slide real easy, it gets a little tricky to time. 
just loosening it actually changed it. So we're now at about 12. So we're just going to tap it until we get it right at 15. Tighten this down. Once that's nice and snug, go back. Make sure you're still at 15 degrees as we are. We're officially time. It's as easy as that. Just go grab you a little timing light from Harbor Freight. It does the job. A lot of people sleep on Harbor Freight and talk crap. That's like what all my tools are. I don't know how well you guys can tell in here. It's a little smoky. I think we've burnt almost all the oil off. Now, I'd have to say our coolant's about completely done. Because it hasn't went anywhere. Well, we're currently idling at 800 which is exactly where we want to be. So I don't need to mess with the idle air controller or any of that. But I am going to show you guys or explain that to you a little bit. So basically here at the idle air control, if you want to adjust that to change your idle, number one, no air leaks. If you have air leaks, it's not going to adjust or compensate for all the other accounted or unaccounted air coming into the system. So it won't work right. You'll be fighting yourself or the sensor may not work. One way to know if it's working, this yellow connector top right here, when you remove it, it should drop your idle, or no, it should raise it about 50. So when you plug it in, your idle will drop. So if you have no air leaks, you want to take a screwdriver back here on the side of your idle air control, which is this screw right here. This one is a Phillips and a flathead. Now I have seen all different types. Some of them don't have Phillips, some of them are only flathead, some of them are only Phillips. It just depends on the model. So sometimes that's a little hard to crack loose, but once you crack that loose to raise your idle, you'll turn it left to loosen to allow more air in or to lower your idle, you'll tighten it and restrict the air going through the idle air control and it will lower your idle. And if it doesn't work, that means you need to take it off, take it apart, clean it with brake cleaner, soak it in some ether or you know solvent get it nice and clean carbon free and reassemble it new gasket put it back on if it doesn't work you need a new sensor and try to find a good used one because they're like almost a thousand bucks new rough well i think it's time to put this thing on the ground we actually need to put nose panel and bumper on now that we know the engine's all squared away exciting news by the way, for any of you guys who didn't know, Josh is selling this car upcoming maybe next year, depending. He may fall back in love with it now that he can drive it properly and enjoy it properly, but he was talking about selling it. So keep that in mind if any of you guys are looking for a Z. We'll do a little walk around of this thing before the video is over, or at least maybe next video so we can have it outside and showcase it a little better. So stay tuned. Now that everything's bled out, it's good to go, warmed up, time situated we got the boss dog out here and we're about to put the front bumper on here as well as the nose panel and get this thing all put back together and ready for josh so while she's here let's do the honors a little bit of fitment to do nothing we can't handle now that that's fully mounted all brackets and splash shields are mounted on the side we get to finish it off with the last piece Remove the hardware and to finish off this lovely time I've had working on UZ. I guess there's one final thing I completely forgot. We need to clip up here on our coolant temp sensor to finish it off. I think we finally get to shut the hood and we're gonna fire it up. First time it's been started with the hood shut. Oh, psych! Just totally spaced it. Earlier I snugged up this 10 mil. Well, I need to take each of these back and really torque them down. And we're actually gonna swap this bottom bolt and this top one so we can actually keep this 10 mil with the lock washer on the bottom and just have these two dress up bolts. Cause previously all three dress up bolts came loose and rotated on them. Officially all buttoned up. Oh. <laughs> Guess we got a fresh latch here. Now I'm going to go over the TPS portion just to kind of give you 
somewhat of an understanding before we peace out on this video snowing outside it's less than favorable weather i don't want to go drive josh's car and test drive it in this stuff especially when it's all clean and been garage cleaned so to set the tps basically you're going to insert like a paper clip or a solid strand wire not a wire with a bunch of braided wire and insert it here in the back of this white wire in your oval tps connector so you'll hook a multimeter power wire up to that and put a ground like over here on your shock bolt or something and you want to turn your key to the on position which is the accessory basically where your lights come on now with that being on you're going to get a voltage reading to your tps at its closed loop or resting position and your goal is to set it at 0.45 volts so basically to set that once you have your pin in here you're grounded up you're going to loosen these two seven mils sockets are better you almost always strip out the phillips just be careful and when you tighten them barely tighten them but you're going to rotate the sensor kind of like the crank angle sensor and you're going to rotate that to get your desired voltage usually they're about in the middle but this one's adjusted a little bit back because that's where the range was when we used this and well that's how you set your tps it's really not that hard once you get it done and it's set start your car let it idle once it's driving or idling you want to unplug this connector for like 10 seconds idle will usually raise it'll lower gradually die down that's because you're relearning the ecu where that resting position is on the throttle position sensor so it knows once it's at that position that's when you're not on the gas and it's just resting and at idle once that dies down you can reconnect that connector the ecu is going to know where it's set and if your car's still idle and funny, then you have some air leaks and you need to mess with the idle air control. Everything has to be synced together and working where you're gonna have one an issue with one and it's gonna cause another weird problem. And you're gonna constantly be fighting them until you have everything working harmoniously. Everything in this engine works together and that's how it works. And that's how it manages to perform the way it does for a 90s Japanese sports car. So pretty much we're wrapping up the video here. Thank you guys for watching. I'm still super stoked that we got Josh's car finally done. And well, we've already got a big stack of boxes over here that's actually accumulating for Matt's car back here because we're doing an NATT swap on that and we're really doing it right. We got wiring harness, everything like, and we've also got a Grady Profec on order. So we are making a boost controller video. We also may be making an NATT AC line video on this car how to use like NA lines on a TT car. That is something you guys have requested and I know that is very, very helpful for us out there that can't afford them TT pipe prices. It's ridiculous. If you guys made it this far, don't forget to drop a like. And if you haven't already, drop a subscribe below and stay tuned for more content. But before we go, better go get them Black Friday deals, especially all this weekend, the Cyber Monday, whatever. Save that money while you can and get you some car parts. Thank you guys for watching. Peace out. Well, we've got about 50 miles on it now. We've tested it out. The car's running great. It's checked all the boxes. I'm super happy with how it drives. Almost got all the oil burn out of the exhaust too. And well, I'm super excited to finally be able to get this to deliver back to Josh and then move on to our next projects. But until next time, stay tuned and don't forget to drop a like. Peace.